I'm Francisco. Uh, I've spent a long time working in fintech uh, and, and you know machine learning and risk. Um, and over the past ten years, uh, I've learned some things. Uh, you know, maybe not everything. Uh, definitely not everything. Maybe, maybe some things more useful than others. And so I thought that um, when I was invited to, to to talk today, I would share some of those lessons. And um, you know, I actually wrote my thoughts formally, and I'll share those notes after in in the uh, Tecton Slack channel. Um, so. Uh, if, if you uh, want to see my kind of structured thoughts on it, um, you'll, you'll be able to find them there. And, and these slides are also, you know, uh, available as well. Um, and then, yeah, thank you uh, to Tecton folks for hosting this talk and for having me on. Um, you know, Mike uh, is, is expert in, in the machine learning feature store systems, um, you know, and I've you know, almost died by a thousand cuts in the past. And so I was very, very fond of, uh, of Feast and Tecton and the work that they've been doing. So. I'm gonna get started. Let's see. So, you know, I think it's important to start with an agenda. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'll try to be brief. Um, and then I'll talk about going from uh, ML zero to one, you know, for folks that are just starting with machine learning, you know, what it takes to get there and, and, and how you can get there. Then I'll talk about the model building SDLC, the software development lifecycle. I think it's an important part of the work that often gets less attention than it deserves. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll expand my thoughts uh, there. Um, the next is on data producers, data consumers, and data lineage. Um, and it's kind of an entire rabbit hole, uh, but an important point that cascades into the work that, you know, feature stores do and, and that, um, you know, machine learning engineers and you know, data engineers work, work on. I'll talk a lot about the common mistakes that I had. Um, and that I made, and I think that's um, that is probably the most important part of, of the talk, if I'm gonna be honest. And I'll talk about the risk and the engine engineering of chaos. And what I mean about that is the quantification of risk. And and I, I don't mean that in any specific risk capacity. I mean that as a general risk construct. You know, I've I've worked in insurance and consumer finance and commercial finance. Um, you know, and ultimately, risk is is in certain buckets maps to certain business objectives but in general you can you can you know define risk as a fuzzy thing and and you know treat risk and the quantification of risk the same independent of the specific use case and then lastly i'm going to try to do a quick demo uh some of it will overlap a lot with fees and tecton um but really it'll, it'll to try to make all the things that i'm talking about here very concrete and how they kind of ladder up together to to really show where the problems uh, come in and, and you know what you can do in some cases about them. So me, um, I'm Francisco. Uh, my first master's in economics and statistics. My second was in data science and machine learning, particularly in Bayesian uh, machine learning and deep learning, uh, a little bit of NLP actually, um, you know, very outdated and irrelevant now, um, but this is, you know, I guess seven years ago. Um, you know, I was in love with economics and statistics. That's what, um, you know, brought me into the field, my love of data. Um, and, you know, machine learning, I found absolutely fast, fascinating. And so that's really what uh, I spent a lot of my time doing. Um, my professional background, I've worked uh, in banking uh, and fintech for about 10 years now. Uh, I've worked at some of the largest financial institutions in the world, AIG, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, some pretty large or interesting fintech startups, um, Fast, which imploded, uh, and Affirm, which I'm very uh, excited about working at now. Uh, and I previously launched and failed uh, in my own uh, fintech startup. Um, and so what I do, I am an engineering manager that works at the intersection of machine learning and data um, at a firm. Uh, and occasionally I write for a newsletter called Chaos Engineering, and you know, particularly about um, some of my experiences. So. Machine learning zero to one. Uh, I think that there are some important things to keep in mind when you're trying to to launch machine learning in your product, right? Um, and and maybe this is inclusive of generative AI, uh, but probably isn't. I'd say this is probably for more tabular traditional use cases. Um, and what I say is that data is the foundation of all machine learning models. 
you know, uh, that, that is true for generative AI as well. Um, basically garbage in, garbage out, right? And I think Mike uh, mentioned this in his talk before, you know, it, it just really can't work without good data. Um, no amount of math uh, can, can fix that. <laughs> um, and software. Software is, is so important. And I started my career not as a software engineer, it's more of a statistician or, or quantitative modeler. And um, as I started to get into, into appreciating this information more, that, that's really what made me um, dive into that rabbit hole. And, and now that's where I spend you know, 99% of my time. And, and, I, and I love it, you know, but what I realized is that, that both of those things combined, um, i.e. data and software, compromise about 90% of the work that you're doing, um, or at least that I've done into getting a model into production. And so that, that's why I made this diagram here on the right. Uh, and, you know, you, you can see that the data com consists of, you know, feature engineering, investigating data issues, which, which you always have to do, identifying sources of truth, uh, building training data sets, uh, building production data pipelines, whether those be fat, batch or streaming or, you know, on demand. Um, in the software realm, it's, it's fetching that data. Um, it's the feature transformations that maybe you have to also still do in real time. Uh, and then maybe it's feature serving uh, and then the model serving and then the service API calls for the, you know, wherever that model interacts with. Uh, and then the last kind of uh, key part, right, the, the, the kind of secret sauce uh, is, you know, the machine learning. Um, and I'll say that this this pyramid to me makes sense because the machine learning stuff, as I said, everything else is foundational. You, you can't really have production machine learning without the the, the two layers below. Um, and the machine learning step, you know, for, for those of you that have built models, um, you know, you spend a lot of time in the algorithm choice, testing different algorithms, doing feature selection, doing hyperparameter tuning, optimization, optimizations, and then a lot of time in the model evaluation, and sometimes uh, a lot of time in the model training, depending on how big uh, the data set is. Um, and so th that's kind of a starting point, right? And I think in order for machine learning to be effective and fast and, you know, reproducible, um, you need the foundation of a great product. And I think sometimes people look at machine learning and say, well, machine learning can solve all of my product problems, and it can't. It, it's just outright can't. Um, product is the foundation of customer value. And, and I think machine learning facilitates customer value. And, and you know, I love machine learning. Uh, I, I write about it, uh, you know, in my leisure time. Uh, but it needs to be tied to customer value because all, at, the all, at the end of the day, that's, that's what we all work to do is provide customer value. And so I really want to emphasize that, that, yeah, I've worked in, in, in teams where people were working on models for the sake of models and not really tying it to customer value. And um, I challenge whether that's effective in, in the short or medium term. I think it's important to understand what customer problem are we trying to solve um, and then using the right tooling to, to enable that. Next, you know, data, again, the quantification of the experience is important to get right. Um, and right in, is, is kind of a joke here, right? So, and then machine learning, machine learning can, can amplify a really great product experience. It can optimize it. It can, you know, optimize risk. Um, it can optimize portfolio. It can optimize which movie you want to choose. It can optimize a basket of goods. Um, you know, so, so that's really where, where machine learning can power it. And then software, I think software is a core engine and it reinforces this flywheel of like improving a product. Um, and, and that's why, I kind of draw this, this, this cycle that when you have really good foundation and a good product experience, you can really actually get a lot of uh, velocity out of, of, of your product. And, and it relies on software, right? If, if you're taking a long time to deploy your machine learning or, you know, the data is bad and you're taking a long time because of that, then you're not going to get the same amount of utility that you want out of, out of your, out of your um, machine learning work. And hopefully that's all, what we all want to do, right? So next, the model building software development life cycle. And this is this slide I'm talking about where it's done wrong. And so, you know, I mentioned I've, I've been working in this space for about 10 years. And 10 years ago, it was very different. I, you know, my, my first model, I built it in, in R and SaaS and SaaS, not S-A-A-S. 
uh, but um, statistical analysis software, one of the oldest statistical machine learning uh, vendors. Um, you know, SAS primarily does work for the FDA. They, they also do it for lots of legacy insurers. Um, and, and they've been a great product for a long time. Uh, they've you know, a lot of, done a lot of really great uh, historical work. Um, but, you know, back when I first built my first model, there was no version control for code. I mean, I'm sure other engineers did, but um, we didn't. You know, we emailed code, which is wild. Or just had it stored on disk um, and accessible that way and, and wrote jobs that way. And so in this kind of silly little diagram, you know, you see that you start off with like some service that's, you know, written in code that's generating some online data. Um, and then you might have some batch pipeline code that takes it and normalizes the schema or something. And then you have some transformed data, that, that thing in green. And then on the model side, you'll see some feature pipeline code, right? That takes maybe the transform data or maybe it takes the raw data and transform it into features that you want to use to multiply something. Um, and then you have some model training code, right? In SAS days with Proclimix and, and Python, it's sklearn or xgboost or PyTorch. And, you know, then there's, um, taking that model training code, you, you get your model artifact, your tickle file, or, you know, set of weights or whatever. Uh, and then you want to convert this into model scoring code. Um, and, you know, you, you can deploy it. That's actually not too bad when people um, copy that. Um, and then there's, you know, sometimes more feature pi pipeline code because it turns out that, you know, maybe not all of your data can be accessed via the batch transformations as, you know, if and Mike had showed before, and that you end up making new code to handle your real-time data. Um, and then, you know, you have to adjust your model scoring maybe for that, maybe not, um, you know, and then you have to take that model scoring code and then connect it with your service code. And here in all of these kind of processes that may or may not be connected, you, you write a lot of code, some of it tested, some of it not, um, and you do a lot of code, but it's important to understand that all of those things from the model from the model artifact to the data set were generated through code and, and a lot of human intelligence. And in order to have that reproducible, that needs to be codified and, and probably tested. Um, and you need to version control it. You need to version control the model artifact, you need to version control the data. Um, and beyond the fact that it's for high quality and reproducibility. It's just because if you make a mistake, which you inevitably will, if you're making all of this code, um, it's gonna be really hard to recover or repair or find out what you did wrong. And so um, I cannot emphasize enough how important this step is. And some places um, don't do this uh, very well. Now, I, I fortunately work at places that do this well. And so, you know, I'm happy about that. But I will say that if you don't have this foundation, you know, it's really important to, to get to get this right. So data producers, data consumers, and data lineage. Data lineage is complicated. Um, what I mean by data producers and consumers is a data producer is somebody who's like actually creating data, like a service that stores user data, as an example. Um, the table in that production Postgres table or whatever is you know, a producer of the data, right? That survey, like a user submits a form about their like, I don't know, video preferences or movie preferences. And they store that in that database. That service produced data. And a consumer could be like a data engineering team or a data science team that's then taking that data from maybe Fivetran or maybe a custom ETL to dump it into Snowflake or something. And then construct it um, out of into another table. And, and now they actually become data producers in that in that way, right? And then now some someone other team is now a data consumer. And the kind of challenge that comes up with that is that goes sometimes indefinitely without you knowing. And so in practice, people just start to create tables on top of your tables because they say, oh, hey, look, just use this table. And then they do, right? Um, and so I looked up this, this DBT a data build tool for those who aren't familiar. It's an open source uh, framework that handles data engineering pipelines and does really great auto documentation, constructs it, and it helps with data lineage. 
And I look just as an example of one table, and this is like some financial SAP fact table thing. Um, and this shows you kind of all the layers that are, that exist into getting into ultimately what's one final table, which is the terminal end of that, and that DAG, that directed acyclic graph. And when you have data in live production systems, what happens is, you know, some top level data producer, or maybe even an intermediate data producer makes a change. And then someone downstream just breaks. And, you know, whether it's your data engineering pipelines or your production systems are just, you know, exploding and you're trying to figure out what's happening. And then, you know, the, the answer always is, oh, somebody changed the schema. And um, really there, there's some kind of silly, but obvious or rather obvious, but kind of silly solutions to this, which are data contracts. And it's, it's basically testing, you know, the changes to your upstream consumers or um, as an integration test or a, a unit test, whatever. Um, and that, that can help mitigate a lot of breaks. It won't solve everything. You know, you'll still have some breaks that are just unknown, especially from third party providers. But, you know, it, it does help, um, you know, catch these things ahead of time. And so um, it this is a really important point because it's like a subtle thing, but you end up spending a lot of uh, time on call or triaging just these all the time. So some common mistakes. Um, memes uh, are my favorite. Uh, so um, I, I thought I'd list some of the creative sometimes ways that I've blown up a server over the last decade. Um, because, you know, it, it's easy for me to see this now and say like, oh, well, don't do this because of this, right? Um, but I had to learn through scar tissue why. And so there are about six of them. Um, there's a lot more, but I try to condense it to, to the kind of most salient ones. Um, featureization errors, just generally a silly bug of, you know, not testing the behavior of everything that you're going to do. The, the most trivial example is a ratio of two features. So if you wanted to take like, I don't know, um, age divided by income for whatever reason as a feature, um, in could be zero. So that's going to give you a NAN. So if you have like an al a machine learning algorithm that handles NANs by default, that's fine. But if you have like a linear regression or any regression or any general linear generalized linear model, it's going to try to do a matrix multiplication and that's not going to work. So you'll have a bad time. Um, ML library errors uh, are another one where, you know, most open source machine learning libraries all have lots of um, pretty heavy dependencies under the hood, um, whether it be Fortran or C++, um, you know, they, they, tend to, they tend to come with a, a lot of uh, stuff to build in. And, you know, usually when you have a specific version of what you developed either locally or on some server, you just want to make sure that that's uh, the same one that's going to be used at serving time, uh, just because it ends up, you know, causing some blow ups later if, if you don't have that. Um, Loading model errors. Uh, this tends to happen when you have a very large model, particularly like you know, BERT or LLMs or an open source LLM that like fitting it in memory is very hard. Um, so that's an important thing to make sure that you right size before you actually deploy um, your server. And then there's service errors. You want to make sure that you handle for the case in which your model blows up and assume, not assume that it's always going to be um, perfect. Um, cause then you'll just get service, you'll get uh, external service 500s, uh, which is never a good time. Then business logic errors. So, you know, as Mike said, I think at the previous talk, th these models are consumed by other people and you want to make sure that, that, um, whatever business logic they have, or that you might add on to your model after, um, has, you know, just good testing for it and you test the behavior to the degree you can. And then lastly, statistical errors, making sure that your training, your, your training sample is a representative population of ultimately the sample that you're going to, you know, use live in production. And if it's not, then you understand the consequences of that choice and are monitoring the behavior very closely. Cause sometimes it makes very good sense why you, you don't have that um, symmetry, but other times you, you might not have done that on purpose. And that's a really important thing to understand. So risk and the engineering of chaos. Uh, like I said, I've worked in risk for a long, long time. Um, 
And what I'd say is that, um, and I wrote an entire article about this, uh, if you're interested in reading it, uh, if not, you know, obviously that's fine. But the, the short version is that the underlying structure of tabular data versus data like natural language or, you know, um, you know uh, images um, is very different. Tabular data is, is chaotic because, you know, you're depending on human behavior and human behavior is inherently kind of weird. And it's it's fuzzy structures, right? Like numbers themselves are kind of arbitrary units, um, and, and we define them. But like you know, it's kind of just random. There's a lot of arbitrary rules that are play in our society, like drinking age being 21, driving age is being different, employment age uh, in different states being different. So all these just rules that you know create structure out of chaos, right? And your model tends to operate within these, you know, systems. And in this example, I, I was talking about um, lending, particularly this is an example of like pretty much the work I did at Commonwealth Bank and Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, there's credit verification, employment income verification, um, and a decision engine and a bunch of different data sources. And there are all these, you know, big interdependencies between these systems. Um, and really, you just have to understand um, how your model and your features fit within this, this system. Um, and it's kind of hard to do because it all depends on data. And so luckily, there are great frameworks that help to, to, to support this. And that's where Feast comes in. So um, I am going to now do a demo. Let's see if I can share my screen. Stop sharing and uh, I have 10 minutes left. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, I actually. So I'll share it uh, quickly. So let's see, I have this set of code here. There's a readme and I'll share the link to this GitHub. There's this feature repo that you get from Feast and, and Tekton as well. Um, there's a Flask application I've written. Um, there's some data um, that exists here, and you don't have to worry too much about it. Um, there's some feature views, um, which is called driver risk. So uh, this example is uh, just showing that. And these feature views are in part based off of um, some files that we have listed, which are just parquet data formats. You can think of them as CSVs. There are entities that we've defined here. And here's the feature view. Um, or the, here's one feature view. We actually, I defined um, a handful, these driver SSN entities view. This is basically a, a retrieval look to see if this SSN was previously seen. So it's a database of SSNs. And you could think that you're verifying from a fraud perspective, this SSN was seen. This is an on-demand feature view. So this is basically at request time, executing an operation to see if it was previously seen. And you'll see here, you know, is null equal false, um, you know, so it's seeing if this SSN was, was seen before. Um, this input request is just defining some additional on-demand feature views, and there's a calculate age. We're calculating age at, at the particular time. And then there's a batch feature view, which is driver yesterday's stats view, which is a feature view showing, you know, basically a bunch of features about yesterday. And if we uh, see this, we'll see, uh, uh, no, that's the wrong one, feature. Yeah, get onboarding features. Uh, no, never mind. It's actually oh, it's batch here. Yeah, here we go. This is creating a simple data frame, like a, a simulating a batch job. And here, you know, it's just some simple rules on top of the data. Um, you know, there's a driver ID, there's a conversion rate, an acceptance rate, and average daily number of trips. And you see these fields are essentially just making some binary operators on top of it to say if this acceptance rate was below 1% and the conversion rate was greater than 80%, that would potentially say that that sounds suspicious. Um, so 
that's um, that's kind of the code. You you can see more about it. Um, you can build this locally with poetry. Um, you know, you just have to run a couple commands. Um, but let's uh, do one thing first. Case apply and so uh -oh. wow, never do a live demo. Uh oh, that's why. And so we've now basically updated the metadata in Feast, and now we're going to materialize the incremental data. So this is actually hydrating um, a local SQLite database. And now I'm going to run this little Flask app, so, which looks like this, and it has some endpoints. Um, and now we can go. So let's see, one, two. So if you want for this demo, I actually did include some API docs. And so you could see these things here um, and the endpoints. And so at onboarding, you know, we're going to see this kind of stuff. But for the user, it would be something like this, right? Um, try to sign up and become a feast driver and our risk score is really high at 78 um, from the onboarding model. There's an onboarding model. You can see the code. It does a simple weighted sum. The sorry, you're not eligible to drive, drive right now. So we can try again. Um, let's see. Let's try 2000. And it looks like, you know, by construction, uh, you know, these two are seated with already previously seen users. And the state was invalid before. So, you know, the only valid state is South Dakota, which is a shout out to where I just moved back from. So let's submit. Oh, so our, our risk is zero now. Um, so we're good to go. And you'll be taken to the homepage. So now you see that you're good. Your daily risk uh, score is 42, whatever that means. Uh, and really what's happening is in the, in the background, we're fetching batch features and we're rescoring every five seconds. And it doesn't really matter. Um, it's just kind of a toy example. But the point being that um, Feast helps with all of these different um, frameworks uh, uh, for um, handling these different items. Um, yeah, and so the, the code is, is uh, you know available uh, to your liking. Dude. Awesome. We'll drop the code into Slack. So if anyone wants to have some fun, play around with that demo, thank you so much for doing a live demo. I know you probably had to pray to some of the demo gods before this actually happened. And it seemed like it went really well, considering all things considering, you know? <laughs> yeah. I will say this though. Migo, I am very disappointed because I did not learn how I can hack a firm and do any kind of shady business on the Affirm platform. So you probably didn't even need to get sign off from the PR department or anything for that talk, did you? No, no, no. I probably did. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is awesome. We got a minute before people will ask a question. And so because it's... Um, we're just going a little bit over on time. I'm just going to ask you one that comes through. Okay. I'm pretty sure somebody has a question that they're going to ask because the chat was very vivacious during this, uh, this talk. I will say, while we are waiting for the questions to come through, how can you just like show that picture of you and totally gloss over the fact that you're wearing that hat? How much oh, did you pay for that damn hat, man? That's got to be, that looks like it's more expensive than my car. That, that's right. I forgot to talk about that. Yeah. No. Um, so I, I, I just moved back from Western South Dakota near Wyoming. Um, and uh, I got that hat at yeah. Rodeo, actually. Um, yeah. I, it, it felt like a Montana, Idaho vibe to it. And yeah, yeah you could have worn it for the talk. I mean, I'm wearing this ski mask. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's, it's in my car. I, I should, I, I, I wear it still here in, in, in the East coast, but you know, it's, uh, people ask I bet you get a lot of looks, uh, <laughs> I bet people love it. You have a belt buckle that goes with it. I actually do, but I don't wear it, I'm, but I got that belt buckle as a kid. I mean, the, the TLDR is my, 
parents are from Mexico and my father grew up on a ranch. And so um, mm. I, I have cowboy boots too with scorpions on them. <laughs> <laughs> and guns with gold plates and your name <laughs> engraved in them <laughs> oh no that hits too close to home no nope. so <laughs> anyway so we are going to um it looks like i mean just because of time and i'm getting pressure from the production crew we may have to end it here so if anyone wants to ask francisco a question throw this in the slack chat and we will have him jump over there oh we got one for you what would be the effect oh my god no really <laughs> everybody's asking generative ai questions the hype we cannot escape the hype uh so there is this question about what would be the effect of generative ai in addressing bot problems um it depends on what lens yeah so for addressing bot problems it's imperfect right it's actually LMs can get good enough that they're, you know, it, it's hard to distinguish between the two. Um, and even using an LM to then battle that is kind of a silly thing, right? I think there's going to be a new world where identity, like authentication identity is, is going to be like a core part of an experience, even at like yeah. a customer onboarding. And that's the only way to deter away from uh, a chat bot. That's my two cents on it. <laughs> Oof, I love it. All right, man. Uh, thank you for this demo, the live demo. Thank you for the hat chat.